Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome to The Amazing World of Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. I want to welcome you to the first of our four Christmas programs this year. We're going to start out with an episode of the Passing Parade, uh, which uh, is John Nesbitt's standalone program where he did the same sort of storytelling that we heard this past summer on the Johnson Wax program, but really this was the full feature. This particular program was released by the Christmas Seals campaign, so it was a special episode. This episode was from 1942, and the title is Emily Bissell Launches the Christmas Seals Program. Made possible by the courtesy of 350 American radio stations and the MGM Studios, this is Harlow Wilcox bringing you a special edition of a celebrated program, The Passing Parade, which will introduce many of you for the first time to the true adventures of living as told by the famed teller of amazing tales, John Nesbitt. How do you do, everyone, to this special edition of The Passing Parade and the story of one of the most valuable pieces of paper the world has ever known? This precious fragment of paper is no larger than a postage stamp. Yet behind it lies a great adventure, heartbreak, comedy, and triumph. Well, a $1,000 bill measures two and a half by six inches, or about that size. And yet my tiny bit of paper is far more valuable, and thereby hangs the tale. It is 1907. We're inside the bedroom of a poor woman's house in Wilmington, Delaware. A boy of 14, a thin, nervous-looking boy with a bright spot of color on each cheek, sits on his bed and grins sheepishly at his mother while a country doctor taps his chest, listens to his breathing, takes his pulse. After a few minutes, the doctor straightens up, grins back at the boy cheerfully and says, Well, it's back to bed with you, my lad, and I'm going to fix it so that you can play hooky from school for a while. Then, smilingly pulling the clothing back over the boy's chest, The country doctor crosses the room, swings the window shut, and picking up his bag, goes out of the tiny bedroom. The boy's mother has said nothing. She has not smiled. She has not moved. But now she rises, a strange wooden look on her face, and silently follows the doctor out. In the kitchen, she stops. The doctor's washing his hands at the sink. And on his face, too, is that peculiar, woodeny, fixed expression. She looks at the doctor a moment, sinks to a wooden chair by the stove, rocks back and forth, her worn fingers held over her face, and she speaks. His father died of it, my brother too. Now my son, my son, my beautiful, strong boy. The doctor finishes washing, dries his hands, and picks up his bag. He places a hand on the woman's shoulder. We shall do what we can. You know, people have been cured of it. Yes, people have been cured, one out of a hundred, one out of a thousand. What does it matter when you know that you're poor, that you can't buy special food, sunlight, rest? And even then, most of them die, millionaires and paupers. Tuberculosis in 1907, death warrant. Not a quick death, a kindly death, no. The heartbreaking wasting away. The periods of fever, the treacherous periods of hope, of feeling great. Why, I'm going to get well, after all. And then the wasting again. And then the slow death. The doctor knows it is useless, and he goes out of the house to face the black hour that can come to a decent medical man when he knows that all his knowledge and his labor are empty, futile things. And what does the mother do? She does what all mothers have done at such times. A smiling face toward the slender boy who lies in the bedroom. Words of hope and of love. Then she straightens her back, puts on her shabby black coat, and goes out of the house. 
She walks clear across Wilmington to a place on the Brandywine River where miracles have taken place. A crowded little tuberculosis sanatorium where the wonderful new ideas of Dr. Trudeau and others are being tried out. And where the sure death of consumption has become less of a sure thing. A great gamble still, but where the players are slowly beginning to win against the odds. The mother goes to the sanatorium and makes her plea. A health worker named Emily Bissell is visiting, and in the office she hears the mother's cry. My son has it. We have no money. But I will work. I will work forever if you will take him in. Just give him his little chance. Just a little chance. And the young health worker turns away as she hears the nurse make an answer. I am very sorry. We cannot take another patient. We are filled up. And as we are poorer than you, we are about to close. Without a word, the mother picks up her purse and leaves. The nurse and the visiting health worker look at each other. Then Miss Emily Bissell speaks. No, you are not going to close up. You are not going to give up. You will take her boy and other women's boys. I'm going to find the money by next spring. Miss Bissell, we won't last till spring. We have a month to go. The money is not here. We have to close within a few weeks. Then, said Miss Bissell, somehow I'll find the money now, this Christmas. Emily Bissell made the rounds in Delaware, looking for a rich man to give her $300 to keep a humble little tuberculosis sanatorium going. She didn't find the rich man. You see, people don't believe in giving money to hopeless causes in the winter of 1907. DB can't be cured, why waste your money? She didn't find her rich man. And that failure in the 35 years since that hour... That failure has led to one of the greatest triumphs of America, the amazing victory that has made a tiny little rectangle of gummed paper a thing more precious than rubies that represents the wealth hidden in the American heart. Emily Bissell in the despair of that money-hunting period, and is there anything so depressing as going around trying to dig money out of people who resent you? Have no faith in what you're trying to do. Well, at any rate, Emily Bissell, at one of the worst moments in this struggle had brought to her attention an envelope. It was from Denmark. It was a Christmas letter some Danish working girl might have sent to her fellow in America. It had a Denmark postage stamp on it, all right, and Emily Bissell was no stamp collector. But what caught her interest were some other little stamps on the envelope. Were they for extra postage? No. It seemed that in Denmark, people were paying a penny for these little seals using them on Christmas packages and letters in addition to the postage stamps, and the pennies they paid for them were going to help sick people in Denmark. Emily Bissell knew in that instant that it had happened, that somehow the woman she'd seen turned away would come back with her boy, that the little sanatorium on the Brandywine River wouldn't close that year after all, that maybe every dollar of the 300 she needed would now come from pennies. Pennies from a new kind of Christmas seal. A seal that said Merry Christmas or God rest you merry or any of the ancient words of love and friendship, but at the same time would bring hope to the hopeless, life to the condemned. Two days later, Emily Bissell was out of printers. Would he make some of these little seals for her? Sure thing, lady. Print them at cost and wait for my money. And later that day at the post office at Wilmington, would they let her put the little Christmas seals on sale in the post office, along with the real postage stamps? Sure thing, lady. Bring them right in. By Christmas, you ought to sell a hundred dollars worth. Only make it clear to folks that they aren't real postage stamps. All you got for your penny is them little seals that'll help battle the white plague. A week later, though, Emily Bissell learns that sales are not going well. People don't get the idea clearly. The whole thing looks like a first-class failure. And with that, she marches into a newspaper office. Will you print a little piece in your paper about the Christmas seals? Sure, lady, we'll use your story. And a few hours later, the editor of that paper sees the proofs. Say, boys, whoever thought this one up is great. Look at the human interest. For every Christmas letter you mail, every Christmas card, every Christmas present, a penny going to fight tuberculosis. Why, the people will love it. Spread it over the front page. Give editorials to it. It's our Christmas story for 1907. Christmas passing and New Year's. And Emily Bissell in January of 1908, counting up the proceeds from the strange little seals. $300 clear for the sanatorium and 
$2,700 more. Americans had bought ten times what she had asked for. And the rest of the story, of course, you know. Christmas seals have become as much a part of the American Christmas as turkey and cranberry sauce. The rich people and the poor people and the middling people are all buying them. By the millions, we gladly take the sheets of a hundred seals each year. A few people buy them by the thousands, but most of us put a dollar or two down and use the seals to place on letters and packages. There are some interesting things about the Christmas seals, however, that perhaps you didn't know. In 1907, when the idea began, almost 200 people out of each 100,000 population died of tuberculosis. Today, three people are cured, where then four people died. And the idea that the health worker used to save that little sanatorium now brings not $300 in each Christmas or $3,000, but a great fortune to be used in stamping out tuberculosis forever. Another interesting fact is that in spite of all the sacrifices that have been put upon us recently, the Christmas seal sale will probably be greater than ever now, for in the American heart it's a part of Christmas. The big gift going to someone you know or love but on each package or le letter, the tiny one-penny gift, which you make to someone you will never see, but whom nonetheless you may aid in bringing the gift of life itself. All this, more than 2,000 local associations affiliated with the National Tuberculosis Association, a public educated in the war of destruction of a disease once thought beyond all cure, sweeping through our country, since a health worker looked at an envelope from Denmark and saw some odd little bits of paper pasted to it and gave the idea to the new world. It's one of the amazing stories of the passing parade, the power of the rectangle of gummed paper that we call a Christmas seal. And there is a brief epilogue to this story, which, like so many other good things, took on a new burden the day the Japs came out of the sky and bombed Pearl Harbor. It's a pity that at Christmas time, and speaking of a thing like this, one must also speak of that day at Pearl Harbor, but we must always remember it, Christmas or not. This part of the story lies in that it has now become utterly vital that we win the struggle against tuberculosis. And a lot of people might not understand that, thinking that all of our effort should merely go to winning the war. All of our effort should, and all of our effort should go in this struggle. Because during war times, disease invariably increases. Food shortages, about which we all know. Crowded housing, about which we all know. Feverish working conditions. Strain and all these trials of wartime cause the dread diseases, like tuberculosis, to sneak up on us again. And it is now realized by the government that a weakened civilian population may not win a war that will take a long, weary time to come to its close. And thus it is that the same plea that a woman once made for her son in 1907 to be admitted to a little sanatorium in Delaware once again goes out to all the nation. When through the Christmas seal campaign, the people who labor to keep these doors open make to you this annual appeal. A little penny seal on every piece of mail that you send out. At least one sheet of a hundred seals to each adult this year, for this is the year that we must guard, among all the other things, the health of our country that is now locked in its greatest struggle. No matter how many sacrifices this Christmas brings to us, the war bonds and the defense stamps and the vast number of appeals that we must meet, we must also meet the challenge of our traditional Christmas gift that is made through the Christmas seals to keep America healthy and to someday conquer tuberculosis. It is America's happiest little gift at Christmas, the penny gift to all who must have rest and perfect care, not in order to be happy, but in order to live. The little gift that prevents others from getting tuberculosis, which is why the Christmas seal is really the most precious bit of paper of its size, for after all, it represents the wealth of America's heart. Your local tuberculosis association, which is now conducting its annual Christmas seal campaign, has presented to you 
this specially transcribed program of John Nesbitt and his passing parade. Welcome back. Well, what a great production. And I think it does illustrate John Nesbitt's strength as a storyteller. Certainly the script is well written. But Nesbitt's delivery, he just had such a way of conveying emotion and uh, bringing home uh, the point he wants to uh, brain. So it has to be said that this story is one where you don't have to strain for the emotion. This is a powerful story, and I think it's a great story of someone at the grassroots doing something and building it up into major force that does actually continue to this day through the um, lung association, although they, you know, broaden their approach beyond tuberculosis. It is kind of odd to hear the idea that you've got to justify why uh, you should be giving money to Christmas seals when there's a war going on. But I think that's because we're not in the middle of war. So much of American capacity had been focused on winning the war. And there was even a competition for change with war stamps. But you couldn't affix two cards. It was essentially a smaller denomination that you save up the stamps and you're able to get a war bond. And so a year after Pearl Harbor, if you're with the Christmas Seals program, you're having to make the case why this is still important with a war going on. Because that's where people's minds had gone. I think they do a really good job with that. Certainly some charitable endeavors were less sustainable or even less necessary. Uh, the poverty rate uh, dropped dramatically with so many people being put uh, into war work. But tuberculosis was definitely something where that fight needed to continue. And in addition to the reasons that Nesbitt listed, you have the simple fact that tuberculosis doesn't care that a war's going on. And so this was, I think, a pretty effective uh, episode and very well read. I hope you enjoyed it. We will be back on Wednesday as we kick into uh, some more old-time radio Christmas programs. I hope you'll join us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.